Okay, hello YouTube. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about the opening phase of the game, probably in a way that you've never heard anybody talk about the opening phase of the game. Um, and once again, if you like this kind of content, um, please go ahead and um, click that subscribe button and uh, click your notification icon. So anyways, what I want to talk about is building an opening repertoire. And this is a really important concept in chess is building an opening repertoire. And the idea of building an opening repertoire is, okay, let's say that you play E4 and you're an E4 player. You aren't just playing one opening. You know, a lot of people, they'll ask me about this opening or they'll ask me about that opening. But when you play E4, you're signing on to play against all kinds of opening. You're signing on to play against a perk. You're signing on to play against a Sicilian. You're signing on to play against a Karo Khan. You're signing on to play against a... French, you're signing on to play against an Alakine's defense, you're signing on to play against a modern variation, and there are actually differences between the modern variation and the perk. There's independent lines, and there's crossovers, and there's transpositions. You're signing on even to play against weird stuff like an Owens defense, right? Or even like uh, uh, strange openings like the Nimzovich defense, or strange openings like uh, the, Scand the Scandinavian, or you know, if John Bartholomew was watching this, I mean, I, I guess he could argue that the Scandi is uh, just this wonderful opening. But, you know, John and I have always disagreed about that. <laughs> so, well, we'll leave it at that. I think the Scandi is what it is. I don't think it's bad. I just don't think it's all that that special. Um, I think it's a, I think it's just a Carol Con with a slightly different move order. But anyways, so you're signing on. When you play e4, you're signing on to play against all this stuff. And actually, I don't even have an arrow going to e5. You're signing on, of course, to play e5. And with each move, like, you're signing up to play, like, all these openings. And it's really important that you have at least one line against every major line that you're playing against, even if that line is, like, a shortcut or a stopgap or something like that. So one of the big secrets is that some openings have mountains of theory, and it just has to do with the way the functionality of chess works. Is The way I like to put it is the ball is either in your court or you put the ball in your, co in your opponent's court. So like I'll give you an example. Like After e4, e5, you basically kind of keep the ball in your court by playing knight f3. Knight f3 is seriously reducing your opponent's options because you're putting pressure on this pawn. And because you're putting pressure on this pawn, there's only so many ways that black can respond to handle this pressure. He can, of course, respond poorly. Um, he could play a move like Damiano's defense, which, of course, we actually still just take the pawn in that case. Um, he could play the move knight f6. He could play a Petrov's and counterattack your pawn on e4. He could defend that pawn a number of different ways. He could try defending it with d6. He could try defending it with queen f6. Um, he could try defending it with knight c6. Now, another secret to preparation is you don't necessarily have to have super deep preparation against absolutely everything. I'll tell you a little secret. I'm a chess master. I've, I've been a chess master now for over 15 years. I've been training tournament players for 20 years. And I know exactly one move against queen f6. When people play queen f6 against me, I know enough to play knight c3 and aim at d5. Beyond that, I have zero preparation against queen f6 because number one, it never comes up. And number two, uh, and when it does come up, it, it comes up with uh, you know fairly weak players that don't know they're not supposed to put their queen there. And of course, then the, the, the third thing is I already have an advantage, so I can figure it out from here. So that's the biggest secret to the opening, is you don't have to prep everything. What you do is you prep your openings to a point where you can take it from here. So sometimes I have plenty of openings where I'm only prepped three moves deep. In this case, knight c3 is the end of my prep. And then another big secret, so if you want to get me out of my book, you can do this. You can play bishop d6. I have no prep against bishop d6, none at all. I'm 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 shooting from the hip if you play bishop d6. I would probably just play something simple again like knight c3 or maybe bishop c4. I don't know. I would just develop a piece. But I'll be completely honest. I got nothing against this move. I have never prepped this move. I've never looked at a single game involving bishop d6 in my entire life. You know, and actually probably the same can be said of a move like a6 or h6 in this position. I've never prepped it. I don't really have a move. If you don't defend the pawn on e5, I'm probably going to take it if, if it's 
if the move is if the move looks insane enough. So let's say after knight c6, you have a couple options available to you. Now what's interesting is if you play the moves d4, knight c3, or bishop c4, you're going to cut down your preparation significantly if you play one of these three moves. Because these three moves actually offer your opponent kind of the fewest number of responses in terms of good responses. Because like I said, like there's certain moves that I don't prep. If it's a bad move, I'm not going to prep it that much because I can take the position from there. So the question when you play certain moves is how many like really good responses does your opponent have that you have to worry about that you're going to have to prepare when you start preparing your openings. So like, for example, if I play bishop c4, there's really only kind of like three respected moves here, you know, against bishop c4. And again, because we're putting some direct pressure on f7 and because there's possibilities of sacrifices and attacks and, of course, blowing open the center with early attacks, it limits us to what we can play here. We can't get away with absolutely everything. So really, it's like basically the Hungarian defense. And there's actually kind of two different move orders for the Hungarian. They either play bishop e7 or they... they uh, D6 uh, is is another potential move order for the Hungarian. I think it's supposed to be sound. But most people that get into the Hungarian do it with uh, bishop e7. And then the two knights defense is knight f6. And you have the joko piano, which can become a, a joko piano or an Italian game or uh, an Evans gambit with the move bishop to c5. So you've basically got these three main options to worry about. Bishop e7, knight f6, and and bishop c5 if you play bishop c4. If you play d4, the options get cut down even more. Uh, basically, uh, anything other than uh, e takes d4 isn't very well respected, and after e takes d4, knight takes d4, uh, there aren't a ton of respected moves. There's bishop c5, there's knight f6, and then there's bishop b4 check followed by the bishop retreat. Those are basically your three main moves that you would have to prep for within the scotch. Uh, everything else is kind of some level of, uh, of, oh, there is one more. There's the queen h4. And you actually do have to prep that just because it does win a pawn by fours. So you would have to prep queen h4. That's the uh, old Steinitz variation. Uh, but everything else is basically close enough to junk or garbage that you wouldn't have to put a lot of effort into preparing a line against it. So that's the secret. If it's garbage, you don't have to necessarily go that far because like once again like uh, I you know another another little secret if I play bishop c4 and my opponent responds with queen f6 congratulations I have zero preparation against this I mean I, I'll probably play knight c3 again I'll probably play knight c3 and try to aim at the queen as quickly as possible just because that seems like the way to go but I haven't spent hours and hours looking at these positions and studying all the nuances right so the Roy Lopez does something a little different. It does what I like to call it puts the ball in your opponent's court again. And what's interesting is it seems like in chess, and this is something that just makes chess an incredibly difficult game to reach that super top grandmaster level. It seems like in chess, whenever we throw the ball in our opponent's court, it seems like it's usually like the most reliable, best way to try to get an advantage. And this is kind of interesting. I think it's it has to do with the nature of the game itself. I think when we throw the ball in our opponent's court with some of these moves, we're also maintaining the maximum flexibility of our own position. And I think that's what bishop b5 does. By, by being a sophisticated move and putting this indirect pressure on the center of the board and leaving the option open to play c3 and down, d4 down the road and get that pawn duo in the middle and maximize white's advantage, we're leaving open this maximum amount of flexibility in our position. And something that's kind of cool about chess is when you leave open the maximum amount of flexibility in your position, it leaves open the maximum number of possible responses to that flexibility from your opponent. Because what's interesting is that the, 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 there, there, there could be a whole encyclopedia just written about the Roy Lopez and all of the different responses that Black has against the Roy Lopez. He could play the Cozio, also called the Classical. He could play the Berlin Defense. He could play G6. And he could play the Steinitz variation with uh, D6. And these are just the non... Uh, he could play Bird's variation with Knight D4. And all of these are considered reasonable moves. They're considered legitimate tries. 
Um, I believe even knight on g to e7 is considered a legitimate attempt. All of these are considered legitimate, and that's not even counting the second mountain of variations that we're going to run into after we put the question to the bishop with the Morphy variation with pawn to a6. If they play a6, um, we can again cut down our theory a lot by playing the exchange variation because that reduces black's options quite a bit. Or we can retreat, and then we can go back into this mountain of things that black can play. And now we're getting into our Zaitsev variations, our Smyslov variations, our Chigrin variations. Uh, we're getting into our martial attacks and just this, this uh, whole giant list of things that black can play against this. The Archangel defense. We have a Schliemann variation. Oh, I missed that on this position right here. We can play the Schliemann with f5. Even that's possible. And that's supposed to be respectable. So... We have to have preparation against all of that, right? So studying the Royal Lopez, you, if you look at some of the preparation work that I've done actually on my own, I've actually, uh, for certain openings, it's almost like if you play E4 and you play the Royal Lopez, pretty much like half of your opening preparation is just going to be on the Royal Lopez because it's such a huge animal. It's not one opening. It's not like, how do you play the Royal Lopez? It's how do you play these 20 openings that Black can play against the Royal Lopez? And all of them are going to be a little bit different, right? So this is, you know, my big secret that I'm trying to get across here in this video for how to prepare your openings is when you prepare your openings, you have to decide um, which positions, what what you're gonna avoid. So where you're gonna throw the, where you're gonna keep the ball in your court, and not throw that ball in your opponent's court to have millions of options or whatever, right? So you need to decide where you're gonna cut down the variations to cut down your study time, and then you need to decide where you're gonna dive into that jungle of variations and where you're going to allow all of these possible continuations and have to do the hard analytical work of looking at all these variations. But then my final tip on all of this is you do not by any means have to have preparation against every single move in chess. It is a total waste of time. Right? Again, if you wanted to really surprise me, I have zero preparation against a move like Queen E7. None. Right? And do I have any intention of preparing against this move? No, I do not. I don't have the time, I don't have the inclination, and I don't see the point. You know, a move like Queen E7 just simply isn't that good. Again, I would pro probably play a move like Knight C3 and simply aim at this Queen. It doesn't make a lot of sense. It's not incredibly logical. It seems to give white a very good position with very easy play. I am not going to spend time trying to figure this out to move 10 or move 20. But I might analyze some very deep variation in the Chigurin variation. If we got really deep into like a Chigurin variation or an open variation, if we got into stuff like this, I might spend quite a bit of time, quite a bit of time, and actually I think I made a slight error there. I think actually if d6, I think c3 is better, and then after castles, because move orders do matter, h3. I would actually put a lot of effort into these positions, because this is a serious attempt by black to equalize or to get a better position with the black pieces. So put the effort in the positions Number one, that you're going to see. Put the effort in the positions that people play against you. If somebody played it against you, obviously you're going to see it. So you need to put the effort into studying those positions. And keep track of the whole picture of what your opening repertoire is. Keep track of what all of your opponent's options are in any given position. And what positions you need to spend time studying. And what positions you don't need to spend time studying. And if the moves are just ridiculous, if the moves are garbage, you don't have to put effort into these. Right, But if it's a legitimate move, a legitimate opening, a legitimate attempt, a legitimate try, you have to put effort into it. And you also have to decide if you're going to play the most flexible move in the position and maybe throw that ball in your opponent's court and have to do a lot more analytical work. Or if you're going to play a move that cuts down on your theoretical preparation and you can kind of specialize a little bit more and maybe you can study one or two or three lines just a lot more deeply 
and maybe try to outplay your opponent that way. Well, anyways, that's my advice. That's the big secret to how you study the openings. You have to think of it in terms of your entire opening repertoire. And you have to put in the time, you have to put in the work. This is not something that happens overnight. People spend years, people spend their whole lives building their, their, their openings, building their repertoires, learning their systems, memorizing all of the, the games, all of the famous games that were played in these lines, and learning the tricks and the move orders and all of these very important things. And it just takes a lot of time. It's not something that happens overnight. Well, anyways, I hope you found this video helpful, and I hope you learned something new about chess. And again, if you like this content and you want to see more content like this, 